really fun to come out to such an awesome convention as New York Comic Con. This is also my first New York Comic Con. I've well, I've always done I've always done San Diego because it's closer to Montana. Not that anything is close to Montana. <laughs> Uh, but I gotta say, I'm astounded by the size of New York Comic Con. This is really quite something. And uh, as always, full of lovely, awesome people. So it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I am going to blather on here for a while about Aragon and the other books in the Inheritance Cycle, my experience writing them. Uh, how many of you have been to uh, any of my previous presentations? I know some of you have, yes. Okay, well, I'm gonna try to not repeat myself too much, but it is a hazard of the profession. Um, also, I'm in this weird position where I can't really talk about the new book too much, uh, because it's not out, and if I spoil it, you're all gonna hate me for it, so. Uh, but I really want to talk about it, <laughs> and I know you really want to read it. Um, so and that is, does make the situation a little bit strange. Um, but I am delighted that you are here. Also, uh, I always give this di disclaimer at the beginning of one of my tours. Uh, so technically, I start touring at the beginning of November, but I think this sort of still counts as the beginning of touring, which is I have not fully worked out my presentation. So you're the test audience. And were you to get me at the end of the book tour, the presentation is going to be perfectly polished, with every joke perfectly metered and delivered with the right, in, you know, tone and timing. Uh, so, uh, but today I'm going to be stumbling through it, so, you know, um, forgive me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, so anyway, I'm going to blather on for a while and hopefully not bore you too much, and then at the end of that, we're gonna do the fun bit, which is Q&A, and we're gonna talk about whatever you guys are interested in talking about with the Inheritance Cycle, and hey, even the sci-fi books, if you're so inclined. There's no dragons in them, uh, although I kind of feel like I ought to write a book with dragons in space, right? You know, that <laughs> I'd probably sell more sci-fi books if I wrote a sci-fi book with dragons in space. Um, I don't know, spaceships are kind of like dragons, aren't they? Uh, Kind of. Depends if the spaceship talks back to you. So, 20 years of the inheritance cycle. I can't believe it. Um, this has been uh, the bulk of my adult life, certainly the bulk of my working life with this series, even though I've done some other things. Uh, when I started working on Aragon back when I was 15 in 1998, so the previous millennia, I never expected that I'd still be talking about it in 2023, much less that people would be reading it. Uh, you know, I was kind of hopeful my parents would read Aragon when I was writing it. I, I never even thought that my sister was going to bother reading it. So the fact that people all around the world are still enjoying the book all these years later is really astounding to me, and I'm incredibly grateful for it because it has allowed me to pursue storytelling as a career, and that's exactly what I wanted to do. Um, since riding a dragon and fighting monsters weren't, you know, career opportunities in Montana at the time, I don't understand why, but apparently they weren't. So, <laughs> um, you know, I started this series. Uh, I've talked about this a lot over the years, but I started this series uh, because of my love of fantasy, my love of dragons, and my sheer and incredible amounts of boredom. Uh, boredom is, an un is, is sometimes, I think, um, underestimated as a, a spur for creativity. Because if you're thoroughly entertained and happy, uh, why are you gonna bother doing anything else but what you're already doing? Uh, in my case, because I grew up in Montana and the nearest town was a 30-minute drive away and I'd been homeschooled and literally no one lived around our house, homeschoolers, um, I had nothing to do. Uh, I really had nothing to do. And writing was the easiest thing way for me to not only entertain myself, but also sort of push myself intellectually in a way that was cheap. You know, all I needed was a pencil or a pen and some notebooks or a few sheets of paper, and I could create something. That's also why I was drawn toward, well, drawing. Um, but the problem was is I read too many things in my uh, high school textbooks about starving artists, so I thought that writing was a better bet. Uh, not knowing how many starving writers there are. Uh, I think the funny thing is, is that more people have probably seen my art 
because of my writing than ever would have seen my art if I just pursued that uh, alone. For those of you who don't know, I've done all of the interior art for my books over the years. Uh, and for Murtag, there are, I believe, seven illustrations in this book. Uh, new maps, new images, new places, uh, language guide, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and no, no one's allowed to grab this book. I will defend it with my life. So, <laughs> um, and, and I love doing that because I think, I mean, I mean, if, you're really, if you like fantasy, you like maps, right? I mean, I know when I open up a fantasy book and I, and I start saying, oh, there's one map, there's two maps, there's three maps. Oh, oh, there's maps in the back. I mean, this is going to be a good book. <laughs> So, I mean, sometimes it isn't, but the maps, the maps definitely add. Um, you can also blame uh, some of this on Brandon Sanderson, because I remember when The Way of Kings came out, and it was, had illustrations throughout it, and I saw that, and I was like, wait, you can do that? I want to do that! Um, so that, that's been kind of the, the inspiration. Uh, so Aragon, I mean, I don't know quite what to say about Aragon that hasn't already been said, but... The experience of writing that book was strange because I didn't know if I could write a book and I had no idea what I was trying to do. And so I just wrote the first draft in like this white hot fever of, I'm having fun and this is gonna be awesome. And then I actually read the first draft and realized that this was not very good. Um, and when I say it wasn't very good, I mean in the first draft, Aragon was named Kevin. <laughs> Which, if you're named Kevin, it's a perfectly great name, but I don't think the series would have been half so popular if it had been about the great dragon writer, Kevin. <laughs> and, but, but I had the basic framework in place, and once I finished that first draft, I had something to work on. And that's definitely something I've learned over the years with writing, which is you can't fix something that doesn't exist. So it's better to make a flawed, imperfect first draft and then go fix it than to spend forever on your first draft not getting anywhere. Uh, after that first draft, and ever since then, the writing got harder because I realized that I wanted to hit a certain level of proficiency and that meant not just treating it as a lark, you know, a hobby. It was like, okay, what do I need to do to fix this? How do I get better? Uh, and the problem is, is, you know, if you're a new artist, it doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's piano or guitar or drawing or writing or singing, you don't know how to get better. You know, you know you want to get better, but you don't know how. And that's where I was very fortunate to have lots of help from my parents, who are enormous readers, and other people in my friends and family who looked at Aragon and covered it in red marks, uh, like, I had, a, I had a theory when I wrote Aragon that if the characters spent a long time traveling from point A to point B, that I should spend a long time describing it so the readers felt like it took a long time. Which meant that when my dad read the first draft, I just heard him growling. I was going, no, cut this pit, cut, cut. I was going, what? There's beautiful descriptions. He said, it doesn't matter. No, one's, no one cares. Yes, there are mountains. They're pretty. Cut. <laughs> um... And that was a huge, huge learning experience. Uh, so I, I spent a year writing and revising the first draft, uh, removing the name Kevin and uh, removing the unicorn that he encountered in the first draft. Come on, <laughs> Dra dragons are better than unicorns. Um, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that he met a, a unicorn instead of Sephira, it's that when Aragon was traveling to the Varden in the first book, uh, he encountered a unicorn in the mountains and it gave him all sorts of powers and it just wrecked the end of the book. So, no unicorns. Uh, and then I gave the book to my parents and we spent about another year editing it and preparing it for publication and we self-published it in 2002. And the first batch of books that showed up, we printed 50 books, which was a huge investment for us. Now, you have to understand, I grew up we had no money. Our first house in Montana was an old log cabin with a 50-gallon steel drum for a stove, and we used chewing gum to plug the holes between the logs because we couldn't afford to have it properly sealed, um, so when it rained, it leaked everywhere. And you don't want a leaky house in Montana in the winter. We upgraded from that to an almost 90-year-old farmhouse with asbestos shingles for walls. 
And because it was such an old house, it had multiple layers on the walls over the years. So, you know, there's some original wall, then there was a plaster wall, and then there was 70s wood paneling. And at night, you would hear the mice and the ground squirrels in the walls dragging pieces of plaster around, and it sounded like, you know, Marley's ghost with chains or something. Uh, and, you know, heating the whole place with a wood stove. It was a beautiful place to grow up, but that's where we were starting from. Uh, so self-publishing Aragon, those 50 books were a huge investment. And they showed up, and the printer had cut them wrong. So all the covers were cut wrong. So we were in the middle of watching Roman Polanski's Macbeth. And these books show up, and we're like, well, of course, we're watching the Scottish play. That's how fitting. So we had to, we had to rip the covers off, send them back for credit, and then they told us we had to dispose of the interiors of the book, so we had a proper book burning. We burned 50 copies of Aragon, and I saved some of the burnt pages, because they actually looked really cool, you know, charred and they had, like some ancient artifact. Uh, <laughs> but that was an inauspicious start to the whole adventure. Uh, and then I started going to schools and libraries, once we actually had some books, and doing presentations. But I was doing those presentations in medieval costume, which would have looked pretty good here. <laughs> but imagine having never been in a public school, being 17, walking into a high school library, wearing knee-high lace-up leather boots, billowy black pantaloons, a big black pirate belt, a billowy red swordsman shirt, and a black beret. And the first time I did that, I heard some guy in the back of the room go, Hello, Romeo! <laughs> yeah, there's a reason I don't wear that anymore. Um, but it was hard because I was going to, the, to libraries and uh, public libraries and bookstores, and of course no one had heard of me or the book. And so I would talk to every single person who came through the front door of a bookstore for nine hours, 12 hours, and try to sell them a copy of Aragon. And most days I sold about 13 to 15 copies, which ain't bad, but it doesn't cover the printing costs and gas and a motel room and food. Uh, best day I ever, I did like 42 or 43 copies, but that only, only did that once. And we were about to give up when school went back in session and I was able to start going into like high schools and stuff, talking to the students. I was doing two to three one hour long presentations every single day. Uh, and the schools, of course, wanted to get kids reading, so they would take pre-orders, and all of a sudden we were taking, we were selling enough books to put food on the table and make it all worthwhile. And we were able to do that and keep that going for about a year when finally um, I got an email from my editor-to-be saying, Random House is interested in buying your series, uh, <laughs> which changed everything. Uh, and in case you don't know the story of that, it was actually another author, Carl Hyacin, who wrote Hoot and many other books, some adult books I won't name. And he was in Montana for vacation, and he bought a copy of Aragon, self-published edition, for his then 12-year-old son, Ryan. And Ryan loved it so much that uh, Carl passed it on to Random House, and a few months later, my Random House contacted me. And the rest, as they say, is history. Uh, all of which makes for a wonderful story after the fact, but when actually living through that experience, it was incredibly stressful because I had no idea if it was gonna work out and you know, my whole family and I, we bet pretty much everything on seeing if the, we could make the book a family business and if it hadn't worked, we were literally gonna have to sell the house, move to a city and just get whatever jobs we could. Uh, and you don't wanna know what jobs are available in rural Montana back in the day. It's, <laughs> there wasn't a lot. So, uh, as I said, I'm very, very grateful for this experience, and then each book since then has been a new adventure. Um, I still remember the first time I flew to New York City uh, to meet my publisher and to start the tour for Aragon, and I was determined not to be like the tourist, you know, gawking at everything, uh, but it was still almost like uh, something out of a science fiction novel or jumping into the future to go from rural Montana and living like this to coming into this amazing city where the streets are like canyons of buildings and there are so many people in such variety. Uh, and you know, to have that experience and then to get to tour the world has been absolutely 
wonderful. And I'm incredibly grateful to be here now. And, you know, the journey since then has been quite something. I, I, I mean, there have been multiple editions. Um, I heard they didn't make a film about the book. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, <laughs> and um, there ha there was a video game based off a movie that didn't exist, um, <laughs> and all sorts of other stuff. So uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been a life changing event, and it's been so much fun to keep adding to this world as well. So even though the inheritance cycle is finished, obviously we have a continuation in Murtag. And people have asked me, is this the start of a new series or is this, is this a standalone? To which the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, and I have every intention of continuing to write stories in this world moving forward. And personally, I would just love to bounce between my science fiction universe and the world of Aragon for the rest of time. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and yeah, to have Murtag coming out on the 20th anniversary. Now, for those of you who don't know where Murtag came from, I had always planned on writing future books in this world, and Murtag was one of the characters I wanted to write a story about. But this specific idea came about in, I want to say it was like 2016, maybe 2017. I don't remember the exact date of the, this when this happened, but uh, it was pretty late in the day, and a fan tweeted at me and said, hey, Christopher, can you tell me what Murtag's up to at, after the end of the inheritance cycle? And I was a little sleep-deprived and a little punch-drunk, and... I tweeted back uh, something about how uh, he had uh, named a magic fork Mr. Stabby and killed a bunch of guys with it, got in a fight with it, and Thorne wasn't particularly happy with that. Uh, which was completely silly, but I loved the idea of that so much that it formed the basis for the short a short story in my short story compilation, The Fork, the Witch, and the Worm, and then that uh, continued to grow until I produced this entire book. So I'm blaming this book on you guys. <laughs> it was, it, it, without a fan, this specific book wouldn't exist. There would be another Murtag book, but it wouldn't quite be the same. So uh, that's, that's been fun. Um, and as for what this book is about exactly, hmm, I, I don't want to spoil it, but I'll say this. It is Murtag and Thorn's adventures through the land as they... Uh, continue to investigate various going-ons in Allegasia, as well as grappling with the events of their past, which of course are troubling them quite a bit. And there is magic, and there are battles, and there's a big fish too. So um, hopefully you will enjoy that. And I have been yammering on here for a little while, so I'm going to do a couple of things. Uh, would you guys like a reading from Murtag? <laughs> yeah? Okay, now I'm gonna do a different reading than I've done before, because um, I was doing a certain reading while traveling for Fractal Noise, and this time I have something else in mind, but I have to find the right page, so one second. Okay, I've not read this before. This is my first time reading this. Uh, this is about... Uh, two pages. So this is, a, this is a slightly longer reading. It's hard to find readings for you guys without, again, spoiling everything. <clears throat> but we are in some mountains in the far north, and this is what happens. Thorn crept closer and placed his head by Murtag's shoulder. How long do you think you will be gone? I won't be gone at all. Murtag smiled. This time, I think we should do things differently. This time, the situation calls for some thunder and lightning. Thorn's long red tongue snaked out of his mouth and licked his chops in a wolfish way. That seems most agreeable to me. I thought it might. Do you mean to kill Bichelle? I mean to talk with her. If we have to fight, we fight, but Murtag's brows drew together as he frowned. We need to find out what she and the dreamers are about. Whatever their goal, they're pursuing it with serious intent. And you want to scent out how many of them are in Nasawada's realm? That too, although I doubt Bichelle will tell us, at least not willingly. He scratched Thorn atop his snout. Either way, 
we have to be careful. Our wards should protect us from her wordless magic, same as any other. He gave the dragon a grim look. Maybe. It's hard to say. If things go badly, it might be best to flee. Flee or fight, I shall be ready. Then let us be at it. Murtag walked along Thorn's glittering length to where the saddlebags hung. He opened them and removed in order Zarok, his arming cap and helm, his greaves and vambraces, his iron-rimmed kite shield from which he'd scraped the Empire's emblem, his padded undershirt and his breastplate. When not marching into open battle, he preferred to wear a male shirt for the mobility it provided, but it wasn't mobility nor even protection he was after. It was intimidation. So, for the first time since Galbatorix had died and the Empire had fallen, Murtag decided to substitute spectacle for subterfuge. As he donned the armor, its familiar weight settled onto his frame with cold, forbidding constraint. Piece by piece, he assembled himself, or rather, a version of himself he had hoped to abandon. Murtag, son of Morzan, Murtag, the dread servant of Galbatorix, Murtag, the betrayer. There was a circlet of gold about the helm, reminiscent of a minor crown, Galbatorix's idea of humor. He'd introduced Murtag as his right-hand man in the Empire, a new rider descended of the Forsworn, sworn to the king and devoted to his cause. Before the crowds, Galbatorix had treated Murtag as all but his son, but in private chambers where the truth could not hide, Murtag had been nothing more than a slave. He placed the helm upon his head and then walked to a marshy pond lined with cattails and studied his reflection. He resembled a princeling sent to war. With the added harshness of his visage, vis visage had acquired during the past year, he found himself thinking he would not want to fight himself. He nodded. That'll do. Then he eyed Thorn. A pity we don't have armor for you. Thorn sniffed. I need none. Besides, it would have to be made anew each year. It was true. Like all dragons, Thorn would continue to grow his entire life. The rate of growth slowed in proportion to overall mass, but it never entirely stopped. Some of the ancient dragons, such as the wild dragon Belgabad, had been truly enormous. Murtag belted on Zarak and then closed the saddlebags and climbed back onto Thorn. Letta, he said, and ended the spell that concealed Thorn in the air. All right, let's go meet this witch, the shell. A rumble of agreement came from Thorn. Then the dragon <clears throat> lifted his wings high, like crimson sails turned to the wind, and drove them down. Murtag clutched the spike in front of him as Thorn sprang skyward, and cold air rushed past with a promise of brimstone. Thank you. Sorry that was a little longer reading, but it kind of needed to read the whole thing for it to work. Ah, <laughs> oh, man, it's, it's kind of cool to be reading from that book. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah, you know, after return, returning to this world after so long, um, I've said this before, but it felt like returning home after being gone for a while. But being able to do it with uh, an extra 12 years of life experience and writing experience was uh, a lot of fun. And I hope it shows on the quality of the final product. Now, I can keep yammering on up here for uh, the rest of the hour, but I would love to start with your question. So if any of you have a question, hold up your hand, shout it out, and I will do my best to answer it. Yes, in the back. Is there ever going to be any more about Aragon and Saphira in the future? Well, you don't know if there's Aragon and Saphira in this book. <laughs> I'm not saying there is, but you don't know. Um, absolutely, there is more Aragon and Saphira from their point of view. 
actually just about a month or two ago, I got my first idea ever for another full-length book from Aragon's point of view. So, um, and it's not that I, I mean, the thing is, is Aragon's story that I, the story I wanted to tell is told. So I'm not going to just jump back in just to sell books. I'm only going to do or write something if I know there's actually a story there. And in this case, I got a story. So now, now I have to actually write the darn thing sometime. Uh, yes? Seeing as though there was not an Aragon movie, <laughs> any plans for a show or a movie? Uh, so since there wasn't an Aragon film, are, <laughs> are there any plans for a show or reboot or something? I think you missed the news. Um, yes, Disney Plus. Ha Disney Plus is attempting to reboot the series as a big budget television show. Uh, I will be executive producing and co-writing. Thank you. I, I cannot make any guarantees as to the quality of the final product, but I'll do my best to make sure that it represents the story and characters and world as best as possible. <laughs> Indeed. Um, we were just getting to the point of getting the show starting to move forward when the writer's strike hit. Now that the strike is resolved, uh, you know, things where everything was put on hold. So now I'm hoping we can regain momentum, get things off the ground. Um, but at the moment, I don't have anything more to say because it's kind of an unsettled time in Hollywood and at Disney at the moment. So hopefully we will get some movement there. And it's one of the... Hollywood is one of those places where, you know, things take forever until they happen all at once. So we're, we're kind of in that place before it happens all at once, but hopefully we will uh, be moving before too long. Yes? Um, will that editor term be anything else about the elves and Arya before the inheritance cycle? Uh, will I ever do anything with the elves and Arya before the inheritance cycle? Quite possibly, although I'm always wary of prequels because then everyone knows how it ends which can be uh, a bit difficult. But yes, we probably will see more about the elves in one way or another. Uh, yes? Will there be more about the two strangers that have Aragorn as the blessing? Right. Uh, will there be more about the two strangers that uh, we saw in, was it Brissinger and in Inheritance? Yes. Yes, they're the stars of their own book. I've been saying that for like over a decade. I suppose I don't have to actually write that book. <laughs> Uh, I did a couple of things like that, slipping in characters I want to write stories about in the series. So uh, this is kind of like the beginning of attempting to answer some of those questions and some of that world building. Yes? You mentioned that you uh, would be starting touring, touring season two. Where else are you going to be touring? So all of the information on my upcoming book tour, tours, is on my website, paulini.net, as well as my... Uh, social media accounts. I'm going to be, uh, I think it's starting in New Jersey on uh, November 7th, and then I'm going around the United States and Toronto until end of November-ish, and then I do an event in Montana, and then I hop over to the UK and a bunch of countries in Europe, and I'll be going until mid-December, uh, which is a long tour, especially when you have little kids at home waiting for you. But it'll be lovely getting to see as many people as possible. Yes? <laughs> oh man, I would love to, but I, this whole package that Random House did for this book, the art design is gorgeous, um, the book itself is a real, it feels like an artifact, you know, it feels really sophisticated and classy and nice, and I'm very, very happy with how it turned out, and I think that if someone, you know, for fans who've been reading the series for a long time, this feels like a nice step up. Uh, without abandoning what makes the series the series. So I'm very, very happy with this, and like I said, now I want to write another one as fast as possible. Yes? We have Angela as this character who's kind of always where everything is happening, and then I do believe she shows up in Crackle. Is that, I don't know if that was supposed to be her, but we infer that was her. Is that, is that something you're planning on continuing? Cause, or is she just going to be like an anchor? <laughs> 
is there a plot actually happening with the character of Angela, or does she just appear here and there? Um, she appears here and there, but there is an actual plot happening with her, and I have an entire book planned about her. Um, no comment on whether there's an Aragon Fractalverse crossover happening. Uh, but that was her in To Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Um, like, no one looked up the, the translation for the name of the cat in To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, which surprised me. Uh, do I read any new books or random self-published books? I read as much as I can, uh, which with two books in a year and two kids in two years has been very little recently. Uh, I would love to return the favor someday to another up-and-coming writer. I have certainly recommended authors and writers to my agent and agency when it's been appropriate. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't really gotten a chance to read much of anything recently, which is frustrating. But uh, I love seeing what people are doing in the genres, uh, sci-fi and fantasy, and it's changed so much over the last 20 years, and certainly in the 90s when I got into reading sci-fi and fantasy. The amount of variety now in terms of story stories and characters uh, is really fantastic, and I think this is kind of a golden age for both sci-fi and fantasy in a lot of ways. Yes, Hat. Will you ever hear more from Roran Stronghammer? You bet. And yes. <laughs> Does Galbatorix actually tell any lies uh, when he's in the Hall of the Soothsayer? I would have to go back and look at what exactly what I wrote in those sections, but as I recall, if he's lying, it's because he believes what he's saying. Um, he may be lying, but he actually does believe what he's saying. That's why he's so persuasive. He's not trying to um, fool Nasawada uh, or Murtag. He's simply deluded in perhaps the truths he's chosen to believe, if that makes sense. Yes? Will I develop more dragon characters? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I actually have one in particular I told my editor about uh, two nights ago that I'm very excited to write about uh, following Murtag because I think it'll be a very different type of dragon writer relationship, and I want to write that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the dragons are kind of why I wrote the series in the first place and always want to write more about them. By the way, I completely forgot to mention, most of you, I'm sure all of you already know this, but I completely forgot to mention that on November 7th, when Murtag comes out, there is also the 20th anniversary illustrated edition of Aragon coming out. It is big. The text is in two columns, like a Bible. And it has, all the pages are color, and there's over 50 paintings and illustrations throughout the whole thing, full color paintings. Uh, it is absolutely gorgeous. So if you want to spend some more money, um, <laughs> I can't recommend it enough. I mean, if I were, you know, 14 and someone gave me that book or I got it, it would be, it would have pride of place on my shelf. So very, very happy with that. And if it does as well as we think it's going to do, uh, I'm sure we'll be moving forward and hopefully doing an illustrated edition of Eldest and Brissinger and Inheritance. So yes, that would be, that would be lovely. But first things first is having this one come out. Um, and you can see some sample images online uh, if you look that up. And it is available for pre-order. So. <laughs> It is not my artwork. Uh, the art is by Siddharth uh, Chaturvedi, who did, uh, he's done a bunch of stuff for like Dungeons and Dragons and Magic the Gathering. Uh, he's a really skilled artist. And it turned out that he grew up reading the books and was a fan of them. Uh, so he really did it justice. And uh, I do not have the skill set to uh, do the sort of paintings that were needed for this. Dragons are complicated. Like, you know, you got four legs and two wings and a tail and a wiggly neck, and it's, um, yeah, it's very, very complicated. And he did a lovely job. So, 
um, yeah, that's that's something I'm extremely excited that it's going to be coming out. <laughs> yes, in the back. Will I ever do like multiple point of view, different characters in a single book uh, in the world of Aragon? Ah, like a collection of stories. Well, I did have my collection of short stories, The Fork, the Witch, and the Worm, which is somewhat similar to what you're talking about. But it is something I plan on doing more with more stories and more point of views um, and some collections as well. It's just a question of time and energy, <laughs> especially with kids, <laughs> especially with kids. Yes? Yes, I still live in Montana. Um, so, you know, after seeing all the entire world and going through your city and going through the world, what made you decide to sort of come back and live in the same place where you grew up? Oh, great question. Why do I still live where I grew up? Uh, well, my family's there, so that's a pretty big motivation. Uh, I, I have had the chance to live all around the world, and I still choose to live in Montana because I like being away from people, <laughs> especially when writing. It's... <laughs> I don't know, it's, it's, I find it hard to focus when there's a lot of noise and activity and all of that, so being in a natural environment is helpful. The mountains where I live are beautiful, so it is naturally inspiring, and especially with regard to fantasy. And uh, again, I've just been there my whole life, so it's, it's very hard to find what I have in Montana in the world. Uh, there's places in New Zealand that are kind of like this, um, and there are places elsewhere in the West, but the problem is, is also access. I do a lot of travel, so I don't want to drive three hours to an airport, for example. So I need to be somewhere where I can get to an airport, I can get to a Costco, I can get the car serviced, but at the same time, I have this beautiful natural environment and uh, uh, wonderful family environment as well. So it's been good for me. I plan, I don't plan on ever leaving Montana, quite honestly, uh, unless too many people from California move there. Yes. So I am going to read a really ridiculous idiot class. <laughs> and the jump in like writing ability and, and, and quality between Aragon and all the other different material that I know you know from like that first book. Mm. What was that transition like going into your second book and wanting to have a, a conventional publishing house behind you? Yeah. You know so what was the transition like going from Aragon to Eldest? Uh, and very kindly, you're saying there's a big jump in quality with the writing. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, it was it was really stressful, honestly, because I knew there was a big audience then for the book, and that made me self-conscious. And at a certain point, I had to learn to put that uh, concern to the side and just not worry about what the audience was going to think, even though I'm trying to think about how best to entertain you or thrill you or whatever, but not to worry about being judged for what I'm doing. Uh, that, and I had the experience of getting lots of awesome editing from my edit wonderful editor uh, at Random House, and then I was able to apply a lot of that to Eldest. Um, and that just kind of was the process from there on. You know, it's, you know, they, it, practice makes perfect, right? But getting critiqued and then learning from the critique and applying it to your practice will help you get better even faster than just practicing. Because if you're just practicing, you'll, you can make the same mistakes over and over again without realizing it if you don't have an outside point of view to come in and say, hey, this, this, this. And that's what editing uh, can do really, really well. And then even when you uh, have a lot of experience, having that outside point of view is still invaluable because you just can't see your work as other people see it. Um, doesn't mean it's easy. It's still hard when someone comes in and says, hey, you've spent all this time working on something. Let's change it. That's still hard. Uh, and you notice I didn't say, you did it wrong, or it's a mistake. Because if you take that attitude, it's, it's, it, can be, it, can, it, can be, it can be crushing. So instead, you take the attitude of, this is a natural part of the process. If something needs further work, that's OK, as long as you have the time and ability to do the work that needs to be done. Um, if you're not willing to do the work, then you deserve every bit of criticism you get. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a huge learning experience. It was a, it was edu an education of the highest order from really awesome professionals in the publishing industry. Yes. Hi.
what things have changed from the outlines to the finished books? Well, specifically with the Inheritance Cycle, uh, I'm going to spoil the last book, so I hope you've read all four books. Um, it's been 12 years, so I've given you fair warning. Um, with the end of the last book, uh, originally Roran was going to be king, Murtag was going to die, Islanzadi was going to live, and I didn't know what to do with Nasawada because in the original outline she didn't exist. So those were some fairly big differences. Um, but uh, Nasawada sort of came about spontaneously when I was writing the first draft of Aragon, and then I had to figure out what to do do with her. That changed a lot of things. And also, Roran did not have enough time to realistically get himself into a leadership position of becoming king, and he would not have wanted it, um, ultimately. So that I could have done that. Nowadays, I have the skill to have made all that happen, but I, don't think that's, I still don't think that's the story I wanted to tell. And uh, killing Murtag and Thorn just would have felt like kicking a, kicking a man when he's down, so to speak. So it was too much. So those were all big, big things that changed. Oh, and Aragon and Arya were going to end up together. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But it, it, the, the series had the ending that it needed to have for the characters as who the characters actually are, not who I wanted them to be. And that's a big lesson I learned when writing is you can have this idea of who you think your characters are, but then you have to pay attention to how they actually are on the page. And again, that's something that Michelle, my editor, really helped me with. Uh, otherwise, I think I would have really gotten myself into trouble on a couple of those points. So. Yes? Uh, yeah, was there anything in particular I was excited to bring to Murtag after this past 12 years? Uh, maybe just a little bit greater appreciation for the difficulties of life um, that we all face. And that's not something I think I maybe could have really depicted as well as I wanted back in the day, just because uh, you know I had such a charmed experience with the inheritance cycle that it took me many years to really look back on it and understand how unusual it was, both for you know, anyone's regular life, but also as a writer's career. And I, then I can look back and go, wow, that was weird. That was unusual, and I'm very lucky for it. Uh, I still remember my first Comic-Con. I was 19, and I was on a panel with Terry Brooks, Peter David, uh, China Mieville, and me. And the panel was called something like Fantasy Tropes or something. Um, and they were all very charming to me, but now I look back at them, I'm thinking like, you know, no wonder a couple people gave me side eyes. You know, there I was 19 and the book was doing as well as it was. It's like, that just doesn't happen. Um, so yeah, I, I think the biggest thing I brought to the book was just more life experience, more, more maybe appreciation for uh, how difficult life can often be. And that worked really well for writing about the story, you know, Murtag's character, because he's not had an easy time. And he doesn't have an easy time in this book, by the way. Um, uh, he, he gets what he needs, not what he wants. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, yes, Glove. Great question. How did I come up with the ancient language which is used for magic as well as the other languages in the series? Uh, I have to preface this by saying I'm not a linguist. I'm not Tolkien. Uh, I did my best as a homeschooled kid in Montana. Um, but I had a lot of fun with it. So the main language, the ancient language, is based partly on Old Norse, which gives it a nice sound and feel, I think. Um, of course, it's heavily modified. It's not actually Old Norse. Uh, but I started because I needed a word for fire, a magical word for fire. And I have a dictionary of word origins, and when I was flipping through that, I ended up finding uh, the word Brissinger listed as a very obscure source word or word that means fire. And it actually has some mythological meaning in, in Nordic mythology. So I loved it, and I used it, and that got me down the, the path of looking at Old Norse. And uh, as an example, so in Eldest, there's the, the blessing that the elves give each other, and that would be 
atras derni o no theldwen bar an relifa un encarta honor un du everinia o no varda uh, now I, I have to i have to apologize because i have a horrible elvish accent and that's because in Elvish, you're supposed to roll your R's on the tip of your tongue, the way you do in Spanish or Italian, and I can't do that. Um, although, does, any, does anyone have a copy of Eldest on you? Anyone? No? Okay, let me see if I can do this from memory. Uh, it's going to be bad, but let me see. You have a copy. Awesome. It, bring, bring it forward if you can. Uh, so, so, unlike Elvish, I have an excellent dwarvish accent. <laughs> and that's because in the dwarf language, you're supposed to roll your R's the way I do, which is by wiggling your uvula. That's the little thing that hangs in the back of your throat. Um, so I'm going to wiggle my uvula at you guys. And I hope you like it, too. But I'm going to have to find this. Give me one second. There we go. Now, the dwarf language I invented from scratch, and I really like the sound and feel of it. Uh, this is uh, this is one that the dwarf, uh, when Aragon and Sephira go to the dwarf city of Tarnog, uh, there's the dwarf who gets all angry and is shouting at them, and this is what he's shouting and saying. Form Hrathkarach! Form Jurgenkarmeter! Nos eda gorath bas Tarnog! Dur incesti rakithen! Yok is war of Aj Barzuligor, Dur Durgrimst Aj Schwelden Rak Anuen, Mog Torak Jurgenvren. Thank you. Yeah, the dwarvish is fun. Uh, the only problem is the dwarves are usually rather hoarse, and no one much likes hearing their uh, love poems, <laughs> except other dwarves. I've always wanted to like write a Dwarvish opera in Dwarvish, um, but my agent tells me that no one's going to read it but me, so that probably won't happen. Um, but yeah, so the languages come from all different sources, and uh, I just try to be consistent with the rules I've created now that I've created them. Were I to create them from scratch, I would go a lot more in depth than originally I did, and the ancient language would be much uh, grammatically more different than English than it is at the moment. So you can actually find some great resources online for creating invented languages. Uh, you just look for conlangs, constructed languages, conlangs, and there are entire websites devoted to conlang construction, and there are people who devote enormous amounts of time to creating invented languages, um, which more power to them. Uh, my thing, though, is I want to actually tell stories, so sometimes I have to choose between spending more time on a language or world building or actually writing the book. And if I have to choose, I'll focus on writing the book and telling the story versus working out the third declension in verb form in my in invented language. But it is fun. It is fun. Yes? Did I take any inspiration from Tolkien when writing? You bet your butt I did. <laughs> I mean, without Tolkien, I wouldn't have written Aragon, let's be honest, uh, because not only was Tolkien a big inspiration, but he also inspired all of these other fantasy writers who inspired me. Uh, so thinking of some of the writers who really pushed me into writing, it would be Tolkien, Anne McCaffrey's Dragon Riders of Pern series, Ursula K. Le Guin's Wizard of Earthsea series, uh, David Eddings, Raymond Feist, Tad Williams, uh, Evangeline Walton's Mabinogian Tetralogy, The Worm Ouroboros by E.R. Edison, The Gorbengoss Trilogy by Mervyn Peake, and many, many others. Um, I could definitely keep going. So it's, uh, you know, it's uh, writing and, and art is a conversation with itself. So I read those art of those people, and I write my stories and kind of think about what they've done and what I want to do, and then people read my books and go, oh, no, I hate that. They should, dragons should be like this. Uh, or they go, I love that. I'm going to take that, and I'm going I'm to do a little something different, but I like that, and that's how culture evolves. Um, but yeah, Tolkien, huge influence, uh, great stuff. Um, you know, he is the founder of modern fantasy. We'll do a few more questions. Yes? Um, 
Oh, so did I have the whole series plotted out when I started Aragon? If you go back and reread Aragon, after Aragon drags Garo to Carva Hall, he has a bad night of fever dreams, and one of the dreams he has is the last scene in Inheritance. No. Yeah. Yeah, and I did that on purpose, just so I could say, look, see? <laughs> I had it planned. Of course, some things did change, as I said, but the general outline... Uh, remain the same, and I, I did have a pretty clear plan from the very beginning. Obviously, it was more detailed for the first book versus the later ones, but I had a pretty good, clear path forward. Did you have a question? I did have a question. <laughs> Do you feel like you got to know Murtag better as a character over writing, the course of writing the new book, and did anything about him learning about him slip by you? Do I feel like I got to know Murtag better as a character over the course of writing this book? And was there anything about him that surprised me? Uh, good question. Um, absolutely, I know him so much better now. Um, writing from within someone's head will do that. Uh, I think what surprised me the most is, and again, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a certain tenderness to the character that he keeps hidden from the world. Um, you know, he has to survive and not get killed, and uh, he's not particularly happy at times, so that, that is what most people see. But there's a certain, perhaps, affection or fondness that he has, especially for children, that surprised me. And that ended up actually becoming a bit of a storyline in this book. So hopefully you will get to read that before too long. Uh, I think we are about out of time here. I don't know if they're going to... Are they going to kick us out? Five minutes. All right, let's do just a couple quick more questions, and then they'll kick us out. Yes? Uh, in the original Inheritance book, you know, got like a few names, the Forsworn. Did you like plan out the other ones, their backstories, or what are they doing? Do we have more of the Forsworn planned out? Yes, and I, you might have another name or two of the Forsworn in this book. Um, yeah, I think, I think you got a couple new names in this one. So uh, I'm, I'm dribbling it out. You know, bread, <laughs> bread, breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. Um, yes? Um, in many fantasy novels, the monsters are kind of without redemption. Um, what inspired you to try and create these characters as vengeance? Great question. <clears throat> Honestly, speaking, going back to speaking of art as a conversation, uh, it was reading some of the criticisms of Lord of the Rings and treatment of the, uh, the orcs. And with, with all of my villains and antagonists, I always try to think of and provide an explanation for why they are as they are. And usually it's a choice in my stories. You know, someone has chosen to do something because they think it's right. It may not be right, but they think it's right. But at the same time, the, the difficult bit is there is a bit of inherent nature. You know, Urgles are not humans. They are sentient. They can choose how to live, but you know, the physical reactions they have, their physiology is different. Um, and uh, just like the Razak are different. I wouldn't say the Razak are evil necessarily, but I wouldn't want to be around them because they want to eat me. Um, but that's their nature. So is the nature evil? You know, if you go back and read um, people's opinions of wolves and bears and mountain lions and things like that, predators, going back like in the Old West, or even earlier in Europe, those animals were often spoken of as evil, as if they had evil intent. And you can understand why. You know, if you're in proximity with them and they present a danger and you have no reason to, you know, treat them otherwise, you treat them as evil in some ways. Um, but it's their inherent nature. So can you condemn them for that? I don't think so. Uh, I find that a more interesting way to look at the world. Um, I don't want to say shades of gray necessarily, but trying not to be an absolutist when it comes to uh, saying good or evil with that, because otherwise that leads to the attitude that, well, like in Tolkien, the, obviously the solution is you just kill all the orcs, because you can't redeem the orcs, and genocide is an ugly word. So that's, that's why I kind of ended up going in that direction. A few more questions, or? One more, One more question. Anyone have a question that I haven't answered so far? Yes. We'll get both of your questions.
Oh yeah, the priests of Hellgrind chopping off body parts. Yes. Oh, okay, what was the inspiration for the chopping off the body parts priest? Do you want the meta answer or the in-world answer? No. I wanted to creep you out. <laughs> <laughs> that was, that's the meta answer. Uh, I think the, uh, less facetiously, uh, I thought it was an interesting metaphor for, you know, the sacrifice people will do for the, you know, in the extremes of belief. Uh, and I wanted to creep you out. So... Uh, yeah, last one. Sorry, very out of course, but I noticed in a relatively recent tweet that you referred to the two Dynasty of Stars and the Atheans as a show. At what point did that change from the movie, or has that changed? Uh, so, To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, my massive science fiction tome that you can kill someone with because it's so big, uh, is in the process of being adapted as a television show, not a film. We started as a film. Uh, we wrote a... I wrote a script as the film adaptation, and it was like 20 pounds stuffed in a 10-pound bag. And the, the producers came back and said, you did a good job with the script. There's just too much in here. What, what do you think about doing as a miniseries or something like that or a television show? And I said, awesome. Let me go write the first episode. Um, and, and the problem was is that swapping the contract, we already had a contract for a film, Converting it to a television contract ended up being hideously complicated, which has slowed things down. But the producers are still very excited about the project, and uh, we're again hoping to be moving forward with that before too long. Uh, I, in the unlikely event that I am lucky enough to have both the Aragon show and the To Sleep in a CFC's show go forward at roughly the same time, I ain't getting no sleep. <laughs> But it'll be fun. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, Sci-fi is actually easier than fantasy because you can use a lot of more real-world stuff in the setting versus having to create a completely fictitious setting that feels real, uh, like Lord of the Rings. Um, and there are very few, I think, fantasy adaptations that really do succeed in making me feel like this is a fictitious world with its own reality uh, without, you know, modern accents or this, that, or the other. So fantasy's hard. Sci-fi's a little easier. I think To Sleep would make, um, hopefully, will adapt pretty well. Um, but again, we're just working to get that off the ground.